July, 1969. The entire world watched as, for the first time in history, a human being stepped foot on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You might remember learning about how significant this moment was for the human race. And after an accomplishment of this magnitude, the next logical step would be to continue exploring further and further into outer space. Right? Well, fast forward to present day, and it's currently been 52 years since we last set foot on the moon. Which begs the question, why haven't we gone back to the moon? I first heard about this in a clip I saw with Elon Musk. I'd always assumed that our technology was just evolving forever, so I needed to learn more. To be honest, I thought I'd find a simple answer and that I'd put together a quick video about it and move on. But I was wrong. I did find the answer, but it turned out that the story of how we got here was far more interesting. Let me show you. To start, let's roll back to September of 1962 when President Kennedy made an announcement that would rewrite history. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. This speech was unbelievable. Only 20 years before this, plane travel became accessible to the average person. And it was only 20 years before that when cars took over America. This would be a huge advancement in technology. Kennedy was a visionary of his time, don't get me wrong. But even he knew that this was unrealistic. So why make the announcement? Did he want to create jobs, explore new industries, or advance civilization? No. This choice was made in defense. All Russia's just wild about Yuri Gagarin, first man to conquer space. Modest, just a family man. It was no secret, either in Moscow or anywhere else, that Russia was ready to make the attempt. At 7 minutes past 7 a.m. our time, the 450-ton rocket went up. You see, just one month before Kennedy's speech, the Soviets had sent the first human to space. At this time in the early 60s, the United States was deep in the middle of the worst part of the Cold War. The thought was, if Russia could send a man to space, surely they could send a nuke to the United States. For Kennedy, landing on the moon wasn't about progress or science or innovation. No, it was about beating Russia to prove that a free society could develop better technology faster. Winning the space race meant winning the Cold War. The Apollo space program started soon after in 1961. 34,000 NASA employees and over 300,000 contractors got to work, all trying to answer one question. How do we get a rocket to the moon? Well, applying the same logic as a plane, the fastest way would be to take off from Earth, fly over to the moon, and come back. But with space travel, you have to consider orbits, gravity, atmospheres, and the general dangers of outer space. Using the same logic as planes just doesn't make sense. It's not that simple. Thankfully, by 1961, NASA had figured out how to get to space. Kind of. Right before Kennedy's announcement, the Mercury program had experienced a major win. They had managed to send an astronaut to suborbital space just one month after the Soviets. Granted, it was only for 15 minutes, and that was just a tiny fraction of the distance to get to the moon. But the groundwork was there, and the more that NASA experimented, the faster they could get to the moon. In 1962, the US sent another astronaut to space, and this flight was a huge difference maker. Friendship 7 was a five-hour mission that orbited the Earth, bringing the US dead even in the race against the Soviets. Now, back to the main question. How do we get to the moon? First, NASA needed to pick a pathway to get there, and they had three options. First, they could send a single rocket directly to the moon and back, but like we mentioned, this is simple in theory, but complicated in reality, so it's out. With the second method, we'd send a rocket into Earth orbit, and from there, a smaller ship would carry on the rest of the way to the moon. But this was slower and riskier, so it was out too. That left us with one final option, called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. 
year, they'd send a rocket to orbit the moon and send a smaller ship from there to land down on the moon's surface. Because of this choice, NASA was able to invent a new rocket, powerful enough to travel hundreds of thousands of miles. This rocket was called Saturn V, and it was designed to separate into three stages and get the ship up to 18,000 miles an hour. In fact, this was the original blueprint of the Apollo ship with the Saturn rocket attached. Above all of that though, it finally gave the US an advantage over the Soviets. Over the next few years in the mid 60s, both countries had made huge advancements from spacewalks to lunar probes. This was the closest the space race had ever been, but that was about to change. The US planned their first Apollo flight in 1967, designed to test the performance of the Apollo ship and Saturn rocket together. During a test on the ship's internal power before launch, there was an arc that caused a massive fire. It got out of control fast, and within just five minutes, all three of the astronauts died. And just like that, the Soviets had another advantage. Or so they thought. Two months later, the Soviet ship Soyuz-1 crashed into the ground, killing its pilot. Both of those disasters were terrible, but with them came massive lessons to help advance each space program. At this point, it was a roll of the dice for who would land on the moon first. The space race lasted all the way to the final seconds of the decade. But we do know how this ended, don't we? Eight years after Kennedy's announcement, the time had finally come. At 9.32 a.m. from the aptly named Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Apollo 11 lifted off. Two, one, zero, all engines running. Liftoff, Over a million people watched as these three astronauts took off. The first stage of the rocket sent the Apollo 11 ship 42 miles into the air within just two and a half minutes. In that time, it burnt nearly six million pounds of fuel. Once it ran out, the first stage separated, engaging the second stage of the rocket, which carried the ship another 62 miles in just six minutes. Last but not least, the third stage sent the ship into orbit, surging their speed all the way past 17,000 miles an hour. They circled the Earth, waiting for the perfect time to send the ship towards the moon. That time came just five hours after launch. Apollo 11 was on course for the moon. Over the next three days, they traveled 240,000 miles, entering lunar orbit halfway through the day on July 19th. It was time to prepare for a landing. Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong climbed into the lunar module, called Eagle, and detached from the main Columbia ship. And just two hours after detaching, Eagle began its descent. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Around the world, hundreds of millions of people watched in anticipation, waiting to watch the first man set foot on the moon. And at 10.39 p.m., Neil Armstrong opened the hatch door on the lunar module. First, they had to collect a bunch of soil and rock samples from the surface of the moon. They had to take a ton of photos and videos of everything that they saw, and third, they had to run a variety of tests and send that information back to mission control. And we can't forget the most important part. They planted a US flag on the moon, marking that the United States had officially won the space race. Over the next three years, the US went back to the moon five times with 12 total astronauts walking on the surface. But with all of that anticipation, all of that progression, and all of the excitement, why haven't we gone back to the moon? The first moon landing was a significant moment in history. So you'd think that everyone around the country would be happy about this major win, and that they'd be thrilled it could lead to the end of the Cold War. But that's just not how everyone felt. The 60s were full of tensions all around the globe. Focusing more specifically on the US, civil rights and equality were at center stage. How could we be focused on getting people to the moon when we hadn't even figured out how to respect other human beings and their rights? 
Back in this time, there was a lot of segregation, and ignoring that to beat the Soviets, a group of people across the globe felt like a major insult. But that wasn't it. As the Cold War heated up, many Americans didn't believe that the space race would even come close to securing a victory. Because shortly after Kennedy's famous announcement, the Cuban Missile Crisis brought the Cold War to its darkest days. In fact, there was a moment in that time when a single person prevented Russia from nuking the United States. Whether or not we made it to the moon, the Cold War would have continued. And last but not least, as a part of the Cold War, the US was getting more involved in Vietnam. At the time, the northern half of Vietnam was siding with the communist beliefs of the Soviets. The last thing the US needed was another country adopting Soviet beliefs, growing the number of enemies that they had around the world. All of these problems required attention to get solved, and more importantly, they required funding. That begged the question, why invest all this money into the potential of going to space instead of focusing on what really mattered? The Apollo program was originally given a budget of $8 billion back in the early 60s, but it ended up going severely over budget. In fact, it cost over $25 billion, three times the budget, which breaks down to over $250 billion in today's money. This wasn't about going to space or landing on the moon. It was about proving that America was better. Knowing that the Cold War didn't end for another 22 years, why didn't we ever try to go farther than the moon? When we first went to the moon, we really didn't understand much about it. On that first trip with Apollo 11, we learned that the surface of the moon was incredibly dusty. So much so that the dust actually filled the lunar module when the hatch door opened. Because of that, the astronauts had to quarantine for 21 days when they finally got back to Earth in fear that they might have caught some sort of illness. And beyond that, going to the moon is incredibly dangerous. There's no atmosphere on the moon, meaning that temperatures range over 500 degrees throughout the day. This is obviously pretty hard to manage for anyone who ends up going there. So we decided that it just wasn't worth going to the moon anymore. However, that doesn't mean that we stopped going to space. We went to the moon to prove a point about America and the technology that we had. But after that, our motivations for going to space changed significantly. Back in the 70s, space travel was still very regular, but the destination had changed. A big part of developing rockets comes down to research. In the process of going to the moon, there was a ton of unanswered questions about the rest of space, about the planets that surround us and the universe that exists beyond our solar system. You see, the moon is just a small piece of what exists beyond planet Earth. For us to travel to Mars and beyond, we first need to know more about the universe. And even though the space race was based on a competition against the Soviets, the shift over to exploration and discovery ended up creating a partnership between them. In fact, in 1998, the International Space Station launched into orbit as a partnership between the US, Russia, Japan, Canada, and most of Europe. And since the beginning of the ISS, we've learned a lot about outer space as a whole. But there was a downside to this. As our technology shifted, we lost the ability to get back to the moon. And the reason was simple. Every rocket is entirely different. Going to the moon is very different than just getting to Earth's orbit. And because over time, innovation slowed down in moon exploration, we've only been developing rockets to get to the space station for 40 years. So wait. You're trying to tell me that in the last 50 years, no one has tried to get back to the moon? Well, that's not really true. Back in 2005, NASA's new Constellation program had three main goals in advancing space exploration. Their first goal was to continue developing the International Space Station, and from there, they'd progress all the way to the moon. But the most important goal of the mission? Figuring out how to use the moon as a starting point for further space exploration. They had a few motivations for this program too, from advancing space travel to enhancing the amount of land that we've colonized. And the idea was that as climate change worsened, we would need other resources and planets to rely on. This mission was the start of the future of the human species. 
but here's the problem. In 2004, the project was granted a budget of a whopping $230 billion. Over the next four years, very little innovation was made, yet they still managed to come in severely over budget. So when President Obama took over in 2008, he initially stated that the project was behind schedule, over budget, and lacking in innovation. That meant that over the next few years, Obama shifted the focus of the program from going to the moon to doing more research on the International Space Station. And as the funding got cut, the program ended up getting canceled. So it's not that we haven't tried to get back to the moon. It's just that we haven't done a good enough job of convincing the people in power that it's worth spending the money. That is, until now. You see, there's something I haven't told you yet, and it's a game changer. You've probably heard about how we're gonna establish a colony on Mars, or that we're trying to get back to the moon. What if I told you that it's literally going to happen next year? But hold on, we gotta rewind a second here. Back in 2017, President Trump announced Space Policy Directive 1, which sounds boring, but it was actually super exciting and very pivotal in the future of space travel. This document paved the way for some huge milestones that have come in the last seven years. Firstly, it set a goal to land humans on the moon by 2025 and explore Mars by 2030. But more importantly than all of that, it facilitated private sector partnerships with companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX. Speaking of that, you've probably heard a lot about the billionaire space race that's been happening over the last few years. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk have all been competing to advance space travel, and they've been doing it on private funding. But of those people, Elon Musk has made huge advancements in space travel through SpaceX. Because of this, and because of Trump's policy, SpaceX was granted a contract to build the lunar lander on the upcoming Artemis missions. But hold on, what's Artemis? Well, this is where I gotta come clean. We've actually already sent a ship to the moon. The Artemis program is the moon landing portion of that space policy directive that Trump passed. And after five years of development, Artemis 1, an unmanned rocket, was sent to orbit the moon and returned to Earth in November of 2022. Because of that success, there's currently two more missions set to take off in the next couple years. Artemis 2, which was originally scheduled to launch this year, will send humans to orbit the moon and return back in seven days. And then there's Artemis 3, which will send humans to land on the moon over a period of 30 days. If we can make this happen, this is going to be a massive step for the future of humanity. But beyond that, if all goes to plan over the next decade, we could have a fully established lunar outpost on the moon. And that outpost will be a huge key in helping us get to further destinations like Mars. So while we reminisce on the space race of the 60s, we're overlooking the fact that right now we're on that same trajectory. If there's one thing you should have taken away from this video, it's that we have a ton of motivations that eventually lead to progress. Could be power, it could be salvation, or more importantly, it can be innovation. In our lifetimes, people will land on other planets. But to prevent us losing progress, we have to continuously advance technology forward. President Kennedy was a visionary, and he was one of the youngest presidents at the time. But now, we have politicians in place that are 80 plus years old and don't understand present day innovation. If we wanna move beyond the moon, if we wanna to go to Mars, if we wanna go beyond that in space, we need politicians who support innovation and the furthering of technology. It's not about power or advancing your worldviews. It's about innovating for the future to give us a chance to live in a world where our dreams become reality. So I'll leave you with a question. What could we achieve if we had just a little bit more imagination? Thanks for watching. If you're new here, my name is Ben and I make documentaries about the current state of technology and how it's shaping our future. If you like this one, you're gonna love many more that I have coming up. So be sure to subscribe down below and check out another video right here.